It was appointed for you to be here today. I know that because it was not necessarily appointed for me to be here today because I wasn't scheduled to speak today. Uh, But uh, God handed me the the baton today through Pastor Brian, and I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful to be here in the midst of this, again, series that we've been covering uh, from the book of Daniel called Epic. And over this week and two weeks from now, uh, taking a pause for some great stuff planned next week for Father's Day with Pastor Brian and his brother Kevin speaking next week, uh, we're looking at some end times prophecy. And Daniel takes us really from here all the way through the end times. And in two weeks, you'll see we go from Daniel 12 through the book of Revelation. So it's going to be a fun couple weeks. Uh, So buckle up, if you will. We're going to be all over scripture over the next couple weeks. A lot of the prophets, a lot of the Old Testament, a lot of the new. And so we begin today in Revelation chapter one, verse eight, where God says, I am the alpha and omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come the almighty. Now, as many of you may already know, the alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. So God says very simply, very plainly, I am the God of the beginning and I am the God of the end. In Psalm chapter 90, Moses actually wrote this Psalm and he says, before the mountains were born or you bought, that you brought forth from the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So from eternity past, he is the beginning. And he is the destiny of all creation. God is the first cause. He is the originator of everything, of all of human history. And all of it will ultimately end with him, with his plans and his purposes being fulfilled. He is the God of the beginning. He is the God of the end. And he is the God of everything that happens in between. Yet I want you to know today that he is not distant. Because in the midst of this epic story, the writers of scripture have another message that permeates the whole narrative. This epic, sometimes difficult to comprehend story is not one of a far off, uncaring deity, but of a personal loving father. And some of you are here today just to hear that message from God. God loves you, he sees you, he knows you by name and he wants to be known by you. Psalm 139, King David says it this way. He says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. This is your appointed time. This is where you were supposed to be. This is your appointed place. He puts you on earth, on your street in this season for such a time as this. He is the God of the beginning. He is the God of the middle and he is the God of the end and not just of all of human history, but of your life. And that's really good news today because some of you are in the middle of something you just wish would end or you're in the middle of something you don't know how it will end or or what's next. Some of you have just started a new season or ended one. It may be working on that degree. It may be a project at work or some job. It's a relationship. Some of you are, are dealing with some things you don't know how they're going to end and, and they're scaring you right now. It's cancer. Maybe you've just gone through a tragedy. Maybe you're going through a triumph. But no matter what you are in the midst of today, I want you to know that God is the God of the beginning, of the middle, of the end of your life. And we have been studying the book of Daniel now for several weeks. And there's this temptation, always there's this temptation when teaching through Daniel to stop at Daniel chapter six, where Daniel is thrown to a den of lions, caught in the hands of God, delivered from the lions. And it's sometimes very nice just to stop there and say, see you later on on the rest of the book of Daniel. But this time we purpose to keep going. And week after week, we have established the history captured in this book. The prophecies given and fulfilled given to Daniel, fulfilled by all these various kings who ruled in Babylon from Nebuchadnezzar to Darius and all points in between. And then last week we went ahead and jumped into chapter seven. And we come to understand now that Daniel has been given other prophecies that he will not see fulfilled, but we know that from history that they have been. There's something more going on here. There are glimpses, if you will, of what will happen at the end of all of human history. Chapter seven, where Pastor Brian started us off with last week is really a summary chapter of what's coming through eight through 12. And Pastor Brian shares that it reveals, chapter seven reveals a prophetic puzzle where we learn to quote him from last week that while the world may appear to be a big, messy puzzle, God is unfolding a perfect plan. Maybe your life today feels like a big, messy puzzle, but you can see that this God can be trusted. You'll see again today that this God can be trusted and that he has a perfect plan for your life. And then we go to Daniel chapter eight. 
And something fascinating happens, something I don't think we've pointed out yet in studying this book up till now. The language that the book of Daniel is written in changes again. So imagine that you're finally able to do your favorite summer reading. You've been waiting for that novel to come out. It finally came out. You finally have time to read it. You sent the kids to camp so that you could read a little bit uh, maybe. And so you just sent them out of the house and you're finally sitting down. Maybe you're at the beach, maybe you're poolside, maybe you're on the porch or in the living room, wherever you are, you're finally getting to read and you're about two thirds through that amazing book. You're about two thirds through this book that's full of perhaps action or mystery or suspense or intrigue. And, and you're feeling like the author, when you get about two thirds of the way through, the author is finally built up ahead of steam. They finally got that ramp to where you're finally going to find out what happens. And as you're reading that book, something amazing happens. The author changes from writing in English to writing in Portuguese. Now this is frustrating. Why would he do this? Or why would she do this? Why, why would they do this at all? First of all, here's what I want you to know. In this case, here's what's gonna happen. I need to find someone who is Portuguese because I wanna know how this book ends and I'm gonna need them to read it to me in English, but there's something more happening here. The author must want Portuguese people everywhere to know that they are especially important to the understanding of what is unfolding and that their involvement is an absolute necessity. Now, Daniel chapter one is written in Hebrew, the language of the Jewish people. Chapters two through seven, technically beginning in verse four of chapter two, are actually written in Aramaic. And then now as we go into chapter eight, Daniel switches back to the Hebrew language. He's the God of the, the beginning, the God of the middle, and the God of the end. Why the change? Well, chapter one is about the Hebrews being taken into captivity. It's a narrative for them. It's important that they understand what happened. Chapters two through seven are really what happened during this time while they are in exile in Babylon. And it, the exile lasts a little bit beyond that, but not necessarily what Daniel writes about. And then in chapter eight, really through the rest of the book, through chapter 12, there are some prophecies that concern Gentiles. That's all of us, the non-Jews. But the language is a reminder that all of this ultimately points back to the Hebrew people and the nation of Israel. Now the emphasis of Daniel's chapter eight through 11 is a future world ruler. One that has not happened even to our day today. The Old Testament prophesies about him and we have come to know this person as Antichrist. And that's the portion we're gonna be looking at today and then we'll go into chapter 12 in two weeks in the book of Revelation from there. And one of the difficult things about prophetic language in general that Daniel uses here and as a genre is not just that there is a lot of symbolism. It's also challenging in that it's not always given in order. And sometimes duplicate information is given with new symbols adding to the description. So today we're gonna to be reading some passages from Daniel eight and nine, but just know that as we go, I'm gonna be pulling things from chapters 10 and 11 and not necessarily noting them, but I hope that you'll read them at, at this week or read them in your small group or whatever it may be. Now, in the beginning of Daniel chapter eight, Daniel is given another vision of the Medes and the Persians destroying Babylon. This is the third time that they have been talked about in the book of Daniel. And now that he is writing in Hebrew again, perhaps he's just trying to help everyone catch up. Now, I wanna give you a little bit of this vision without reading too much of scripture, but just so you won't get lost in it, but just understand this. Beginning of this vision, Daniel is caught up into another place and he's standing by a canal and he, he sees this beast that ends up being the Medo-Persian empire. It is a ram with two horns. And the ram with two horns is doing fine until we get a stronger goat. Now, I don't know why it's goats, but it's goats. And so we're going with goats today. If you need to picture other animals, you go right ahead, but I can deal with goats and God helps us deal with that. So here we go. Verse five, this is from Daniel. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came up to the ram that had two horns. This would be the Medo-Persian empire, which I had seen standing in front of the canal and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram. He was enraged at him. He struck the ram and shattered his two horns and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Now we know from history what happened here. If we were just reading it, we would have no clue what happened here. But we know that 300 years later, 
this goat from the West is actually the Greek empire. And it's being led by this young, brilliant military mind who was mentored by Aristotle. His name, history, we call him Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great conquered the world so quickly, the known world so quickly and brought and had so much power under his control. It it was as if his feet had never even touched the ground, I think, as verse five gives us. Now, it's important that Daniel predicts Alexander, but he also predicts another ruler who is very important for us in prophecy. Daniel chapter eight, verse eight goes on to tell us this. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. This would be about Alexander the Great now. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. He's now predicted the death of Alexander the Great. Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, capitalized to signify that this would be some deity. This is actually looking at Christ here magnified itself to be equal with Christ and even, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. Now, again, we know from history that what Daniel predicts happens now over 300 years later, he wouldn't live to see it, but God has given him another revelation that comes true. You see, after Alexander the Great dies, There is a 40 year struggle for who gets control over the whole earth and four rulers emerge. We know this from history. This idea of the the four winds, it just means the, the whole earth was under these four guys control and they were just split pretty much into quadrants. And the one of them comes in charge of the beautiful land and he magnifies himself to be equal with God. Now the beautiful land is Palestine. And I mean that in a geographical sense, not a political sense. So this is the area where the nation of of Israel is today. This little horn from history, one of those four who would become in charge of this portion of Alexander the Great's empire is known to us in history as Antiochus Epiphanes. In rabbinical sources, he is known as Harasha, which means wicked. History would tell us he is deceitful and cunning. He is known to be one of the cruelest and most self-aggrandizing of leaders. He removes the burnt offerings, the ability for the Jewish people to give their offerings to God, that demonstrate their devotion to God. He removes that and forces them to worship Zeus. This is actually the man that the Maccabean revolt happens against and ultimately the traditions of Hanukkah come because they were fighting against this man and his rule. Daniel 8 verse 15 picks it up and Daniel says, when I, Daniel, had seen this vision of this little horn, I sought to understand it and behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. Now in Hebrew, the word for man here, it's really mighty man and it's the word gabor and the consonants are G-B-R. If you want to write that out or keep track of that. If you were to add the name of God that's most commonly used as a prefix to the Old Testament, you get L. So you, now you have Gabor L and you may have figured out who Daniel is speaking to. He's about to figure it out. Verse 16 says, I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Ulai and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So Daniel is speaking to Gabriel, but before Gabriel speaks, he is given permission by someone with a voice of a man. Gabriel, tell him what's going on. Why is it so important that Daniel is getting this from Gabriel? Because Gabriel seems to be God's most key messenger. The word angel means messenger, but this guy has a special place. He is the one who was sent to Zacharias to let him know that his wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a son and his son would be John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. Gabriel is the one who was sent to the Virgin Mary to explain to her that she's going to bring forth a son and his name would be Emmanuel, God with us, God for us. Whenever Gabriel is giving a prophecy, it is very important. So why was Gabriel sent to explain a prophetic vision of Alexander the Great and Antiochus Epiphanes 300 years after it was given to Daniel. Daniel 8, verse 17, Gabriel speaking now. So it says, so where he came near to where I was standing and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. And Gabriel says to him, son of man, 
understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Verse 19, he said, behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of indignation for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. What is explained to Daniel is that these two rulers, Alexander the Great and Antiochus Epiphanes, they have all the characteristics of a world ruler still yet to come. In fact, he has not come yet, but he is the ruler that will be appointed for the time of the end and God has made that appointment. He will, this ruler will command control of the whole world with lightning speed. He will be wicked. He will put himself up against the people of God and God himself. Daniel 11 gives us more description of him and as a future ruler, he will make up his own gods. He will make up his own rules. He will start wars with the strongest nations on the planet and he will conquer them. He does when he wants, how he wants, whatever he wants. He makes up new rules about finance and government and no one on the entire earth can stop him and many will follow him. And Gabriel tells Daniel, that the time of all of that has already been appointed and everything else that has been revealed to Daniel up to this point has come to pass. So how does Daniel react to this? Verse 27, then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. And then I got up again and carried on the king's business. I was astounded at the vision and there was none to explain it. And if I'm Daniel, I have the same question that you have sitting there in your seat today. When is this gonna happen? When is this going to happen? And in a very specific and important prophecy, God outlines some further specifics to demonstrate again that he is the God of the beginning, the middle and the end. Chapter nine, Daniel begins to pray for his people and it's an amazing chapter, it's an amazing prayer. It's a great prayer for us to pray for our country today and you can look at that at home. But as, as Daniel chapter nine unfolds, Daniel's believing that a prophecy that's been given to him, some of the scrolls of Jeremiah have been given to him, is about to come to an end that the prophecy about the captivity of the people is about to come to an end. So when is all the rest of this going to happen? If we're about to get out of this place, if we're about to be able to go back home, or at least those who have come behind me in this case for Daniel, if they are all gonna be able to come back home, then when is everything else that I have seen up to this point, when is this going to happen? Because for Daniel, he has seen so many prophecies fulfilled, they have now become history, but yet these things that he is seeing today have not yet come to pass. And Daniel's worried. And so God sends Gabriel back to Daniel with another message after this period of prayer and lays out some incredible specifics to Daniel. In verse 24 of chapter nine, it says this, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Now a more accurate way of giving this particular word in Hebrew is not 70 weeks, but 70 sevens. So Daniel now is given this illusion, beginning of this vision to 70 sevens or 77 year periods. So we're talking about 490 years that for Daniel are still yet to be defined in history. And how do we know that those are not weeks, but that they are actually sevens? Because we can now look back at history and some of what was given to Daniel in Daniel chapter nine has already been fulfilled. Yet another prophecy explained and clarified, and this next one is pretty amazing, verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood, even to the end that there will be war. Desolations are determined. Now, this is fascinating. The first seven week period or 49 years begins with the command to build and restore Jerusalem under Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra helped rebuild the place for worship. Nehemiah helped build, rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. It happened just as God had told Daniel it would, 49 years from the time that the decree went out from King Cyrus, someone who did not know God was used by God and all of this was set in motion. Now there's a second period. 
There are 62 seven-year periods, and if you combine those, I'll do the math for you, it's 483 years. 483 years from the decree that goes out from Cyrus is a very interesting time frame. Ezra goes back to the city, Nehemiah goes back to the city, but if you were to add up those 483 years, you get yourself to AD 30. What is significant? Well, according to this prophecy, that's the time where Messiah will be cut off. And according to history, as best as we can tell, AD 30 is the year that Jesus was crucified. And the prophet is even giving us a nod to the fact that after that, the temple in Jerusalem and the city of Jerusalem would ultimately be destroyed. The angel Gabriel explains to Daniel down to the very year of Jesus's death. And we know, theologians have looked at this, historians have looked at this, Sir Isaac Newton looked at this, and I'm not exactly sure what inspired him to do that, but after he looked at it and said, yes, those 483 years end in AD 30, everybody went, he's a pretty smart guy, he's figured other stuff out, so we're going with what he said. So from the Old Testament, Daniel, given hundreds of years before Christ, has predicted it exactly accurate. And there's one seven year period left. And what we know from the book of Daniel is that from the time that Jesus was crucified and as we know, risen and ascended to the right hand of the father, something very important happens in history. God presses pause on the nation of Israel. Now this is important for us to understand. The nation of Israel and the Hebrew people have been the vessel of all of God's plans and promises, beginning with Abraham and then to Jacob and Moses and King David and beyond. Israel is the vessel that God chose to make himself known, to make his plans known, and then to bring salvation through Jesus, who is 100% God and he is 100% Hebrew. Romans chapter nine, verse five, the apostle Paul is talking about this. He says, to them belong the patriarchs, that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And from their race, from the Jewish race, according to the flesh, as far as it's up to human form, is the Christ, is Jesus, who is God over all, blessed forever. From the Jewish people come the savior, but not just of the Jews of the entire world. John chapter four, Jesus explains that. He says, salvation is from the Jews, but not limited to them. The apostle Paul talks about this in Romans chapter one. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. But look at what he adds to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now God's plan was to provide a way of salvation for everyone. And he has done that through Jesus. Now we have to understand Israel is still important and it still has an important role to play in the future. And we will get to that in a couple of weeks. But the salvation that came through Jesus, through the Jews was not just for the Jews, but all the non-Jews as well to everyone who believes. That means if you're sitting in this room today, that is really good news for you. And we are here to proclaim him and to make him known to as many people as possible. So if we're looking at these prophecies, the time that we are living in now is simply known as the time of the Gentiles. That's you and me for most of us, all of the non-Jewish people. Now this is important. Israel has not been replaced by the church. It's, the, it's just that God has pressed pause on what will unfold for the entire world once again through Israel. And he's grafted us in to experience and to receive all the blessings of all of the promises of God. The church is now the vessel used to bring God's salvation plan to the world during this time. It's through the church that God is on the move through this period of history. And you have been appointed to this period for such a time as this. And what are we to do? First Corinthians chapter one, the apostle Paul tells us we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block to the Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Listen, we do not know when God will once again hit play. And when he does in this time, he will go back to fulfilling a promise to his people that will play out in seven more years. The prophet Ezekiel refers to it. Jeremiah refers to it. Daniel does, and we'll look at it in a couple of weeks. But every prophecy written in this epic story that has ever been written down 
All of them have come true except for the one that wasn't supposed to yet. But when God presses play, you can be sure he will once again prove that he is the God of the beginning, the God of the middle, and the God of the end. We don't know when he will press play. We don't know when he will press play, but we know a couple of things to look out for. And one of them is this ruler that Daniel is talking about in chapters eight through 11. And there will be one recognizable action that will put the whole thing in motion and we will be able to see it and know it. The whole world will know it and it will begin Daniel's 70th week and all of that will play out in a seven year period of time. And we'll talk about that in two weeks. We have been warned that this ruler is coming. We have been warned that Antichrist is coming. But the New Testament goes further and explains that the spirit of this Antichrist is already in the world. John talks about this in 1 John chapter four. He says, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of what you have heard that it is coming is now already in the world. Now John makes sort of an obvious statement here to anyone who is listening that if you're here and you do not confess Jesus as savior, then you are anti Christ. You have sided with and you have aligned yourself anti Christ. Now, this is a difficult statement. When you have unbelieving friends an unbelieving family to say that they are not just aligned with Antichrist, but some of the prophetic language even really aligns Antichrist and Satan together. So if you are not aligned with Jesus, then you are aligned with Satan. That's a difficult thing. But here's the important thing to know. There is still time for them. And anyone here today, anyone listening to this message at any point, there is still time for you to turn to Jesus. There is still time to be on the victory side of history and of eternity on the side of the God of the beginning, the middle and the end. John says there will always be false prophets. And they, there are, there are to this day. They are brilliant communicators. They're full of charisma and self-help. They establish massive followings and they deceive even God's people. And truly it's because they've already been deceived themselves. They will make you feel like you can accomplish anything, that you can move mountains. But what you need is faith in the one who can move the mountains. When you are convinced that you can live life on your own, when you are convinced that you can accomplish anything in your own strength, understand this now, that is the spirit of antichrist. When you are convinced that you can handle your circumstances on your own, that you can save your relationships on your own, save your finances on your own, or accomplish any goal or project that you are given, I don't care how talented you are, if you try to do it apart from Christ, then you are anti-Christ. Why not give all of those things over to the spirit of God living inside of you, the God who is the God of the beginning, the middle and the end, and watch what he can do in the midst of all of those circumstances. Pastor Billy Graham used to say that there are three invitations given to all of us. The first invitation is to rest in Christ. Matthew 11, verse 28 says, come to me all who are labor and heavy laden. Jesus says, I will give you rest. We are in a world that tries to weigh us down with so many things, so many distractions, so much work to do, so many things that create anxiety and struggle and stress. And Jesus says, surrender to him all your cares and concerns. And I want you to know today that anything less than surrendering all of it to Jesus, every area of your life, every area of your life in alignment to him, anything less is anti-Christ. The second invitation is to discipleship. John chapter 12, verse 26 says, if anyone serves me, Jesus says, let him follow me where I am. There my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. It's an invitation to partner with God. It's an invitation to learn more of him. It's an invitation to become like the savior, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to remain in him every single day. Anything less is anti-Christ. And the third invitation is to live under his rule and reign, to bring every area of your life and it may take the whole of your life and mine as well. But the invitation is to bring every area of your life, your work life, 
your relationships, your health, all of it under alignment with Jesus. He is the, his desire is to be the God of every area of your life. And giving him anything less is antichrist. And giving him anything less is not to acknowledge that he is the God of the beginning, the middle, and the end. Now, I want you to picture something with me for just a moment, and it's, there's no goats involved, I promise. So let's start out a little morbid, but stay with me. I want you to picture, if you would, your tombstone. Okay, it's, it's gray, it's got a little shape to it. If you end up getting a big statue in New Orleans, good for you, but that's for, for me, let's, let's keep it simple, okay? What's at the top of that tombstone? Your name. You didn't get to pick it. Those people that God gave you to, they picked it. And when you were a teenager, you were mad about it. Let's be honest. We don't know why. We all think your name is fine. But there was a period when you were like 13 or 14 where you're like, could I please, could, how, do, how do I get the change going? Do I pay $400? What do I do? So that's the top. That's the header. And you didn't get to pick it. This is the marker of your life. On the left-hand side is what? your birthday. And let's be honest, if you're born near Christmas, you're probably upset about that too. We're sorry, but you're sharing your day with the rest of us. Mine about every three years falls on Mother's Day. Quit your crying. I have to share with those wonderful people in my life. All right. I didn't get to pick it. The left-hand side, the day that you're born. What's on that right-hand side? The day of your death. And it's been appointed by the God of the beginning, the God of the middle and the God of the end. And you don't get to choose it. And God willing, it's not today or tomorrow. God willing, it's far off into the future, but you don't get to pick it. This is the marker of your life. This is what people who don't know you are going to walk by and maybe you're going to pick out some little saying or worse, like your first cousin's gonna pick out some little saying and they're gonna put it there. But really up to this point, you have no say on what other people come by and see made up your life. Now in between your birth date And in between the day of your death, there is one little line, just this little insignificant line, the smallest portion of the whole thing. And that represents your life. And the invitation is to not even use that part for you. The invitation is to surrender that portion. The one thing that you get a say on, the invitation is to surrender that portion to the God who is the God of the beginning, of the middle and of the end and to use as much of that as feasibly possible for his glory to put him on display, to be completely aligned with the savior that he sent to die for you, who gave his life for you to bring all of that little line into alignment with him, the savior of the world, the one who loved you, who died for you, the God of the beginning, the middle and the end. That's the invitation to surrender even that portion and to live your life in Christ to not be anti-Christ in any area of your life, but to live your life in Christ alone, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, that makes him the beginning. For by him, all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. That makes him the God of the middle. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. That's what he wants. For it was the father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, to align everything back to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, he is the God of the end. The crucifixion and resurrection solidifies it. The firstborn of all creation who came and lived and died and shed his blood and was buried for you, did that so that you could live your life fully in alignment in Christ. And he's risen again. And he's coming again to demonstrate once again that he is the God of the end, but not just of all eternity, not just of all humanity. The invitation today is to allow the God of the beginning, the middle and the end to be the God who knows you by name, who wants to be known by you with every breath that he has given you. Would you bow your heads with me? Today, child of God, He is the God of the beginning, the middle and the end. And if you're here as a believer, the Holy Spirit residing inside of you today, I just encourage you and challenge you, allow yourself to be challenged by the Holy Spirit. Is there any area of my life that's not fully in Christ? Is there something I'm trying to accomplish apart from him? Is there any area of my life that is anti-Christ? And would you begin in this time of prayer, maybe even in repentance of changing your mind of what you've been doing and turning it to God, saying, I'm not gonna try to do this on my own anymore. I'm not gonna try to be a husband or a wife on my own anymore or a parent. I'm not gonna try to go to work on my own anymore. I'm not gonna try to be a good friend to the people around me on my own anymore. I'm not gonna try to accomplish anything on my own anymore, but every area of my life is going to come under the authority of Christ alone. I want that dash, that little line to be fully in Christ. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, that invitation is there for you. It's there every single day, every moment until you do it. He he wants you, he's calling you. And that compelling presence inside of you right now, that urge inside of you right now is not me, not that eloquent. It's the spirit of the living God saying that right now, if you will believe in your heart that Jesus came and died for you and has risen from the dead for you, and if you will confess that with your mouth, with just a prayer even in this moment, then you will be called, as Terrence told us earlier, a son or daughter of God, child of God. If you're here today and you've never prayed to receive Jesus right now, would you pray to him in your own words? Say, God, I come before you right now and I want to give my life to you. I wasn't expecting this today, but I'm believing that this stirring inside of me is you, God, and evidence that you know me and see me and you appointed this day for me. So God, I believe that Jesus came and that he died for me. I believe that he's risen for me so that I could have a brand new life, a different kind of life. If you prayed to put your faith and trust in Christ today, in just a few moments, we're gonna invite you to let us walk with you in that and let you know what to do. But for every single one of us, the invitation today is to not allow any part of your life to be anti-Christ but to put all your hope and all your trust in every area of your life in Christ alone.